like it just felt okay everyone will go and go do a job at google everyone's going to go off mm. and get a job at these other companies but like oh if you want to be really special if you want to have a huge impact on the world if you want to stand out the way mm. you do that at least here in california is the mm. biggest tension is exactly what you described right okay there's mm. on one hand you want to keep acquiring knowledge and build your network and get more ideas right so that's like the reason to keep mm. staying in a stable job salary mm -hmm. job on the other hand you're getting older your expenses yeah. might be going up. You might be getting married. You might be having kids. You might buy a house, right? And then it becomes harder <laughs> and harder. You get addicted to getting the weekly or bi-weekly salary, right? It's very hard to leave. Yeah. You have to find out how can I manufacture luck? For the vast majority of people, I think that this is the first time that we have experienced any kind of downturn in the market. You know, literally since yeah. 2009, right? Mm, the market right. has always been up and to the right. Like it's always been good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so it is a bit scary. And I think that if you're graduating now, then this is probably the worst job market that. Uh, hi, Rav. Thanks for taking your time to do this. Uh, I know that you have been doing a lot of work on your end, building a startup like Taro. And on the side, you have a YouTube channel too. So you're definitely, definitely doing a lot of great work. And uh, thanks for doing this and taking your time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for hosting and I'm excited to chat. Yeah, so basically in today's chat, I want to discuss about all of your experiences because I think that most of the engineers would go through what you have already gone through in your career. So let's just start directly from your college. So you studied from Stanford, like that's the most uh, best place for any, any engineer to study and so everyone wants to be there. So I want to know about some experiences that you had, like... Uh, what makes Stanford special in your, yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest thing about Stanford, and actually, I think the same is true probably for any kind of community or class that you take, is the mm -hmm. people. So I say the same mm -hmm. thing with Y Combinator. Like Taro went through Y Combinator. And the best mm -hmm. part about Stanford, the best part about Y Combinator, are it allows you to dream bigger because the people mm -hmm. you meet in the program are mm -hmm. so ambitious and so different from you that you something you never mm. thought you could do, you all of a sudden mm -hmm. say, hey, I could do that too, because this person's doing it, I can do it too. And I think just yeah. opening your eyes to what is possible is a pretty powerful thing, pretty powerful benefit of going to a place like Stanford. So basically, how did going to Stanford help you get into uh, Y Combinator? Does this have a link? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there is certainly a very deep link in the sense, uh, I'll explain that link, but I think like pretty much every aspect of my life in some okay. way or other has been impacted by the people i mean just at a very base level at a very basic level mm. um mm -hmm. my closest friends here in the mm -hmm. bay area in california are the people i went to school with right kind of naturally stanford yeah. today a lot of my people mm -hmm. who i hang out with my wife is from stanford like at a very oh, okay. basic level um that, that's been a huge impact beyond that from the mm -hmm. career perspective um, mm. I did a bunch of different internships while I was in college. I think the majority mm. of my internships came from a referral from alumni. So I had this oh, program cool. called like alumni mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea is you get paired up with some alumni. And so two of my internships actually came from different mentors I had um, in this program. Mm. So that, that's another very concrete output. Um, mm -hmm. And then connecting it back to Y Combinator. Yeah, like my, I think my first exposure to Y Combinator was actually a Stanford classmate of mine had gotten into YC. And that was a big deal. I was like, wow, you got in in 2013. Yeah. <laughs> and they were um, about they were about to do it and they were excited. So that was mm. a positive, like, okay, they can do it, I can do it. Um, my mm. actual co-founder in getting in was someone who went to UCLA. I met him actually not at Stanford, but at Facebook or at mm. Meta when we were there working together. Okay. Um, mm. Y Combinator is a big commitment, just like, you know, going to a college mm. is a big commitment. And so obviously okay. you want to de-risk it. You want to understand, okay, what is the experience like? Was it worthwhile? Um, mm. would you do it again? And so many of the people I talked to in my network, just to understand my options and evaluate the program, mm. many of mm -hmm. them were Stanford grads, right? So I think that's kind of the big thing. It's like, you have this network of people who you can trust. So mm. any kind of program or thing that you're thinking about, yeah, you can get a good, credible opinion from someone rather than, you know, I don't mm. know if I trust everyone on the internet. You shouldn't trust everyone on the internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so that was a big benefit of just, you know, having this community of people. Basically, between starting Taro and between Stanford, uh, you did a lot of work at top tech companies, including Meta, Pinterest, and you were a software engineer too and a manager too. So when did you actually decide that you want to build this startup Taro? So I think, honestly, I think I had the initial inclination during the okay. end of my time at Stanford. I feel like mm -hmm. as I was graduating, it was, you know, 20, 
2013, 2014. That was really mm-hmm. where startups became really cool. And I think I got sucked into it, right? It's just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, you have, I mean, even before that, I think you had people like Mark Zuckerberg and, um, you know, like Airbnb and these other companies that were taking off. Like it just felt like, okay, everyone will go and go do a job at Google. Everyone's going to go mm-hmm. off and get a job at these other companies. But like, oh, if you want to be really special, if you want to have a huge impact on the world, if you want to stand out, the way mm-hmm. you do that, at least here in California, is you start a company, right? That's the, that's the path to yeah. money and fame and impact, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I do think there was some element of like, even back then, I want to do it. But at that point, I feel like I didn't feel I was ready. Just in terms of my mm-hmm. skill set, in terms of my network, in terms of the idea, right? I mean, all of those mm-hmm. are so important if you're doing a company. And so mm-hmm. I kind of viewed the time from graduation, 2014, up until 2021, when I left mm-hmm. my job, or January 2022, when I left my job, I kind of viewed it as like, all of these things are preparing me to do a startup. So it was always in my head. But it okay. just like, uh, it was only until recently that I found, that I felt like I had a good co-founder, I had a good idea, and I had the ability to get lucky to, to actually like mm-hmm. succeed so that's kind of mm-hmm. what led me to eventually start Haro. okay yeah that sounds great so in, in the time that you when you were a software engineer and i see that you were a tech lead plus manager too at mm-hmm. Meadow. so uh, how did you like your experiences there uh, what did you like being more as engineer or a manager yeah i think yeah. there are definitely good and bad parts of both jobs i feel like it depends very much on of what you're looking for and so that you know it depends like where you are kind of in in life and what kind of impact you want to have so for example mm-hmm. i think it's so hard to beat the gratification that comes from hands on keyboard writing a bunch of code and shipping a feature as an engineer it's just so it feels so good to be able to build something and then have yeah. people use it right as a manager yeah. you don't actually get that you very mm-hmm. rarely will be spending three or four hours writing code in the way that i used to be doing as an individual mm-hmm. contributor but I do think that you'd replace that with a feeling of I was able to coach someone to have more impact or I helped someone feel more confident in their job. And that's also mm-hmm. a very special feeling. And so mm-hmm. I think that yeah. like the general path, which I think is a good one, is that you start off doing engineering work like, as an individual contributor. Mm-hmm. That is like the basis for being a good manager, because the way you are able to coach someone and give people feedback and give people confidence, I think the best mm-hmm. managers are the ones who have done it before. And so I do think yeah. that it's kind of a transition. You start out as an IC and you become a manager. And then where you end up depends on like how good you are in some sense. I, I, I don't okay. know. I, I feel like <laughs> I'm not the best. I'm not like the top 1% of software engineers in terms of coding ability. There are people who code much faster than me are able to architect mm-hmm. things in a much better way. And so from that perspective, I feel like if I want to just for most people to grow their career and really get the highest level, there's like a pull toward management just because yeah. that one is more kind of relationship driven and context driven rather than, okay, you have to be a brilliant engineer every mm-hmm. year and yeah. invent a new framework. So I do think that, you know, and also like with Taro, right? I'm building a startup mm-hmm. very quickly. Mm-hmm. You have to shift into, okay, product building mode, strategy mode, um, like mm-hmm. long-term planning, which is more management rather than the actual individual mm-hmm. contributor work. So I would say like right now in my career, I'm, kind of headed more on the management route. When did you decide that you want to move to become a manager and how did the transition happen? So like if anyone wants to do a transition, what should they follow the path? Yeah, totally. So I feel like this actually relates back to what we were talking about earlier in the sense Mm -hmm. that I felt very unprepared to do a startup when I graduated. And even, you know, two, three years after graduation, I didn't feel prepared. And one of the things Mm -hmm. I felt like I was missing constantly was the ability to lead a team to mm. build up the trust with a group of people and say, hey, I'm going to give you feedback now like as an authority figure in some sense, as a manager. I had never done that before, and that was scary to me. And I felt like mm. I would like to have that experience before I go off and do my own thing. And mm. so in terms of like the transition, I knew that I wanted to do it, at least before I left the company. Mm. And the thing mm. about management is that it's something that you can't just come into a company and immediately become a manager. Yeah. Well, it, it's harder because you don't have the trust and context. And so the position I was in at Facebook was ideal because I had been mm-hmm. at in the same team literally for about three years or two and a half years at that okay. point. And then I transitioned. And so I was already a very senior engineer. I had the trust of the people. I had done good work for the past two and a half years. And so if there was ever an opportunity to transition into management, that was mm-hmm. the time. And so I felt like, let me, let me de- try the transition. 
Um, and then mm. I did that for about six to seven months and I actually switched off to a different team before I quit mm. Meta. But that was the okay. kind of transition period. <laughs> yeah. So uh, between uh, doing the startup and after graduating, so there was a gap of like seven years in which you worked. Yeah. So, uh, so with each year passing by, didn't you think that like it's getting late or uh, the risk of like you get a lot of responsibilities as you uh, yeah. uh, personally so didn't you think these fears come into your mind <laughs> yeah 100 percent. i feel like that's like the biggest thing when i talk to people who are a bit younger and you know starting out the mm. biggest tension is exactly what you described right okay there's mm. on one hand you want to keep acquiring knowledge and build your network and get more ideas right so that's like the reason to keep mm. staying in a stable job salary mm -hmm. job on the other hand you're getting older, your expenses yeah. might be going up, you might be getting married, you might be having kids, you might buy a house, right? And then it becomes harder <laughs> and harder. You get addicted to getting the weekly or bi-weekly salary, right? It's very hard to leave. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I do think there is like a tension there. Um, mm. So in my case, I feel like I had saved enough money that helped, mm. right? Like I okay. had saved enough money that even if I completely screw it up and I make no money for two years, I mm. felt confident that okay, I would be okay. I would maybe okay. not have as much in savings, but at the end of the two years, I would have learned a lot mm. and I'll go back and get a job. Um, the other thing is that I still don't have as much responsibility. Um, I don't mm. have kids. We actually, my wife okay. and I, we bought a house, so that's kind of scary. <laughs> but back <laughs> yeah. when I was, back when I left Facebook, which is, you know, like mm. um, uh, 10 months ago, I didn't have a house. Mm. So I thought, okay, no house, no kids. Um, my wife is working. So, but I think the big thing also is that I felt like I had a co-founder who is similar to me. Like if you have a co-founder who's really needs more, more money or like more cash as a salary, or they're like mm. way younger, it's hard to really work with them. But I feel like yeah. in terms of my co-founder was willing and able to leave his job. We were both mm. very aligned with what kind of company we wanted to build. Um, mm. And we got along and that's actually very rare to find all of those things yeah. happening. And so that was, exactly. I think the other big thing is okay. Now is the time um, mm. we have all these things lined up. We'll just let's leave and, make a go at it mm. yeah so so what was this process of how you stumbled upon this co-founder because generally uh like whenever someone starts to build a company they think in their circle like circle of friends and i think that never seems to work sometimes yeah i mean so, i think the thing is like what i tell people is that the co-founder relationship is like a marriage it's a very long and deep relationship and you will have a lot of disagreement a lot of uh you know, you have to resolve a lot of conflict because things will always go wrong. I mean, things today are going wrong with Taro and I have to go resolve, right? So like, you have to be okay with that. And so mm. if you, like the way you, the what you said, if you go to your co to your friend circle and you say, hey, who wants to start a company with me? Oftentimes mm. that doesn't actually work out that well because there needs to be some depth of the relationship before that. And so I think mm -hmm. the thing that benefited me and Alex is that we actually didn't start out thinking, okay, this is going to be a co-founder. We started out okay. because I started a YouTube channel. Well, we were on mm -hmm. the same team, so we worked together that way. And then maybe a year mm -hmm. later, I started a YouTube channel. And it turned out mm -hmm. that Alex, back in 2008, 2009, like early days of YouTube, he had done mm -hmm. one of the largest YouTube channels for video games. Okay. <laughs> um, and so like that was our connection. It's like, oh, we have this unique, like, not there are not that many software engineers who are also YouTubers. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was our unique kind of connection. Like Alex said, hey, I can help you out. And so mm -hmm. we did that for maybe six or seven months, like he kept giving me advice and guidance on growing the YouTube, which is really fun. And then from there, we started doing a project together. And again, there was no mm -hmm. idea of it being a startup. We're just like, hey, let's just work mm -hmm. on something together because we both like each other and we like mm -hmm. building stuff. And once mm -hmm. we did that, that one, that project failed. And then we did another project. That project also failed. And at that point, <laughs> okay. like, now, wait, even though we failed a couple of times, we still enjoy working with each other. We, we think we have the skills needed to build something really cool. Um, mm. Would you be more interested in um, like actually doing this full time, like actually leaving the comfort and the security of a job? And I think mm. the more we talked about it, the more excited we got. And that was mm. really how we made the decision to to go in full commitment. Um, mm. But I think having that string of failures and having that relationship before we decided to start a company, that was really mm. important to make us feel good about the decision. Yeah, that seems a very great advice that... Uh... You don't start out as founders, you start as doing some projects and then basically you find that you like working with each other, then you become, become startup founders too. Exactly. And actually, so, you know, one other thing I'll say there, which I think is <laughs> important is like, you have to work hard to manufacture that, right? 
So, mm. you know, I, I went to Stanford and I'm lucky and I was able to be around people like that. But let's say that you mm. are, you know, in the middle of the country, like you're from Michigan, which is actually where I okay. grew up. Or like, you know, mm. you're in the middle of India somewhere. You may not mm. have that level of network or connection. And so then it, the burden is on you. You have to find out how can I manufacture luck? Like, like, like what you're doing, like you have a great YouTube channel, you're putting mm. yourself out there, you're trying to connect with people. That is yeah. then how you become friends or develop the relationship, which will then lead mm. to starting a company, right? So if you feel like you don't have yeah. that, I feel like it's incumbent upon you at, to, to figure out how you can find an online group or an in-person mm. connection. You have to find out how can I manufacture luck and get lucky and like find that person mm. who will then, uh, you know, yeah. become your co-founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people try to do that with uh, either post graduation or, or or those schools. Yeah. Like in India, we have a, a bunch of good great IIMs. So a lot of people after engineering go to IIMs to build that great network. So uh, how did you arrive at Taro? Like, what was the ideation phase? Were you like searching for ideas, or like how did you stumble upon this that you have to build a community for software engineers where they can ask any type of questions, come for help? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things here. One is founder market fit in terms of like our familiarity with the problem space. Alex and I have been engineers our whole career and we knew that uh, this is something that we had an opinion about. Like we had a, a strong point of view on how to build the product. That was one element. Second element is that we felt like there was a need for it. Like when I look back at my own career, um, there was not really a good place, unless you got lucky, like the way I got lucky with a good mm -hmm. network of people, it's hard to really find good advice and good mentorship. And so we felt like, hey, this is a problem that we think does exist and we can build something helpful. Um, and then I think the other part of it, like one lens through which I evaluate a lot of divisions is mm -hmm. how likely am I to get lucky, right? Kind of what we were just talking about with relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think that by the time we had left our full-time jobs to do Taro, mm. I felt like we had a couple different opportunities to get lucky. So first of all, um, I had this YouTube mm. channel. And it, you know, it mm. wasn't huge. It was like a small, medium size. It was, I think, at that point, how big was it? 25,000 subscribers. So it, okay. wasn't, it wasn't huge, but it also wasn't tiny. So I felt like, wait, mm -hmm. if we could just keep this growing and have YouTube as distribution, that can give us mm. a really good unfair advantage for our startup mm. like again like unfair advantage is same as being lucky like now i have this thing that yeah. i need one video to go viral and then that can really take mm. off um, and help yeah. the company right so that was mm. one element mm. the other element is that we had re relationships at these big tech companies right like i had worked at meta or facebook for five years alex had worked at mm. robin hood at that point i worked at pinterest before that i worked mm. at a startup and i felt like hey we're building a product for engineers and we're uniquely mm. able to leverage our connections within Silicon Valley, right? Not many other founders have that. So, hey, we can yeah. do something which is hard to replicate. Again, that's one more reason why we feel like we can get lucky here. Um, mm. That was number two. And then number three was that, I guess, just the founder market fit that I talked about earlier. That We felt like we have a point of view. We have a passion for this area. That's, again, mm. something that you can't really easily replicate. Right? If some, you know, like, like the classic example is um, if you have some really well-financed company in Europe mm. or some other part of the world come in and try and make a clone of your product, would they win? Mm. And I think the answer is yeah. probably no, because they would just not be able to replicate exactly what we're trying to do, the the environment we're trying to create with Taro. And mm. all of those kind of led me, led us to believe that, hey, we can actually do something. And there's enough coals in the fire, if you will. There's enough things that were, are, are coming in that mm. uh, one of the, if one of them pans out, we will be we'll have a successful company. And so I think that was what led yeah. to Taro. Yeah, I also really like a platform. Like uh, the people there have genuine questions. They are struggling with various things on job and definitely it's a nice place to ask questions, to talk about the spheres. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a goal. It's like compared to other platforms, like I'm not sure if Blind is big in India, but there is mm, Blind, explain. there's Quora, there's a lot of other platforms, but a lot of the type of discussion is not not relevant to engineers or just not high quality enough. And so I think the idea mm. with Taro is like, can we actually create the environment or the platform that we wish we had back in yeah. you know, 2014, 2015, as I was coming up. And so I think that's the goal. I mean, it's still a lot of work to do, but it's mm -hmm. an exciting, yeah. exciting opportunity. Yeah. So 
uh, how did your life change as a founder? So uh, people say that founders usually work like 18 hours a day. So yeah. <laughs> is this really <laughs> and work on a very low salary as compared to what they did? So how did your life change being a founder and as a manager, let's say? Yeah, I think there's definitely a dramatic change, right? I think a couple of things come to mind. One is, yeah, for sure, you don't get the salary and pay that you would if you worked at a big tech company. I mean, the way we've mm. rationalized it is that we're okay. Let's let's give ourselves the opportunity and the space to mm. try it out and fail or succeed for like two years, right? So for two mm. years, I'm not even worried. I'm not okay. making half as much as I would or even a quarter as much, but that's okay mm. because we'll give ourselves two years. And then at that point, we'll evaluate whether we can really increase how much we can pay ourselves or what the next step is. But for two years, let's, let's not even worry about it. Um, mm. In terms of like planning and um, road mapping, I think that's a big difference. At, at Meta, I could tell you with pretty good precision, okay, in six months, here's roughly what I'll be working on, right? Because the project and the mm. team was structured yeah. in such a way. Now, I have no idea what my life will look like in six months. Taro could be very, <laughs> very different in yeah. six months compared to it is now, even, even three months. I mean, I think I have some idea of like one month from now, what are our main priorities? But three months, mm. six months, certainly one year from now, the whole thing could be mm. different. And that you have to be okay with that mm. level of ambiguity. You have to be okay with that level of uncertainty because mm. you're the boss, right? You have to control what you do, where you spend your time. And that could be scary, but also empowering. Um, mm. And then I would say the third thing is, yeah, what you mentioned about work hours. Definitely, yeah. you know, you have, you, you have a fire now under you that there's a, there's a really good chance you'll fail. And even going through Y Combinator, even though we've raised some funding, um, mm. It's not like someone is there to just save you if you fail, right? Like you're you're on yeah. your own, and there's most companies will fail, right? The the eventual path for eighty ninety percent of companies is that they're just gonna go bankrupt. Yeah, right? right. So you have to really work hard, and you have the motivation to um, avoid that destiny. And so f for me, the way that manifests is that I'll usually spend about ten hours a week on YouTube, which is. Mm. It's not really a startup, but it, I view it as very directly linked because many of the people yeah. find out about Taro through YouTube or LinkedIn YouTube, or the yeah. content. Mm. So I spend about 10 hours a week there and I spend about 40 to 50 hours a week um, mm. on the business. Okay. And then I mm. usually try and do some amount of just like networking or talking to people. So there are a lot of founders in YC. There's a lot of other businesses like talking to mm. folks like you, just, you know, fun conversations. And so, yeah, yeah. It, it is kind of busy. But mm. it's also fun. Like I get to control where I spend my time, so it's it's also very different. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. So, uh, how did Y Combinator actually help you in your journey to build Taro? So, a lot of people think that what getting into Y Combinator is the like only thing that they want to do, and yeah. that, that's the best way to do a startup, basically. <laughs> I I, yeah. I think that's actually pretty true. Like Y Combinator <laughs> is quite amazing. Uh, okay. The advice that I tell people is that if you are a first time founder and mm. you get into Y Combinator, then you would be stupid not to take it. Like it, it yeah. definitely has so much value. Um, mm. And I think I boil it down into three reasons. One is the money, right? You get $500,000 and that's helpful because now, you know, for the first, for the first six months of Taro, we didn't pay ourselves at all because we had mm -hmm. no funding. And then we got into Y mm -hmm. Combinator in June. And now we actually mm -hmm. were able to start starting in July. I think we started taking a small salary. So that's like one obvious benefit, the money. Second mm -hmm. is the signaling. I think mm -hmm. whether it's fair or not, a lot of startup success is determined by how well do people think you're doing, <laughs> right? <Okay>. It's like, <laughs> oh, right. that person got funding from Sequoia, right? Sequoia, Andreessen, Kleiner, Perkins, these are the top VC firms mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, And so if you mm -hmm. get funding from them, people automatically assume that you're legitimate. That makes it easier for you to hire people. People want to partner mm -hmm. with you more. Like it's almost mm -hmm. like a self-fulfilling prophecy where you get the funding and therefore you succeed. And so mm -hmm. to some degree, YC is similar. Like people automatically take you seriously because you're YC. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to have a meeting mm -hmm. with a company, you say, I'm, I'm Y Combinator backed, I'm YC backed. Then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I think people uh, are, <laughs> take you a bit more yeah. credibly. So that's mm. the second benefit, the signaling. And the third benefit, which is actually mm. even potentially more important than the other two, is mm -hmm. the feedback you get, right? So when yeah, you get into Y Combinator, right. you come in, the whole point of the program is to give you mm. feedback, advice, and a structure to figure out how you can mm. succeed. And so every mm -hmm. week you're getting 
a conversation with a, a group partner and other mm-hmm. companies in the batch. And that's so motivating and so helpful to help you mm-hmm. really accelerate. And so the, the money, the signaling and the advice, those three mm-hmm. things, I think, um, have really helped Taro just figure out, okay, what exactly are we building? Who are we building it for? And how do we charge for it? How do we make money from it? Right. Those are all the mm-hmm. kind of fundamental things you have to figure out if you're building a company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so from that perspective, I think Y Combinator was quite valuable. Yeah. So in raising further rounds of funding also, it will definitely help you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, I kind of bucket that into the signaling part. Like, hey, you're mm-hmm. Y Combinator and all of a sudden people want to talk to you. Other investors want to talk to you just because you're Y Combinator. So yeah, I mean, there's a huge, huge benefit for future financing mm-hmm. rounds. Yeah. Uh, and also does like being from Stanford also helps get better investing that, that the founder is from uh, Stanford, UCLA. I think it does. So it depends on the round of financing. So I would say that, you know, mm. where we are, we're quite early. Most of the companies mm. in Y Combinator are quite early. Like they either just barely have a product. Many people don't even have a product. And so yeah. when you have no product, you have no metrics, then the background mm. of the people involved in the company mm. matters a lot more. Right. So mm-hmm. then, okay, hey, you went yeah. to UCL, you went to Harvard, you went to Stanford, whatever it might be. Then people start to look at that a lot more. But when you start to have a product, like for example, Series A, and people are yeah. judging you based on the metrics of your product, then the background, it doesn't matter if you went to, you know, okay. some middle no, middle of nowhere in India or US, yeah. like no one cares, mm-hmm. right? If you have a good mm-hmm. product and you are making tons and tons of money and um, you're growing rapidly, then mm-hmm. you're going to be able to raise your Series A, Series B. But yeah, earlier on, I think the mm. the pedigree or credibility of the founders matters a lot more uh, that that seems fair because like a lot of things depend on like how the company is doing so that they can invest in uh so what are your major vision with taro like uh, how do you envision it to be like let's say suppose an year or so the way i think about taro is that we are a company to serve builders to serve engineers mm. right engineers increasingly what you're going to find in the next year 10 years mm. 50 years Engineers yeah. will become more and more and more important. Our whole life mm-hmm. will be dictated by the software that we built, right? Mm. right. I mean, that's, you're already seeing that trend. Like compared to 20 years yeah. ago when I was growing up to now, mm. I mean, my life is dominated by the software and the computers that I interact with. And that's going to be increasingly yeah. true. And so mm. if we can build a company that helps mm. the builders, helps the software engineers become 10% more effective mm. at their job, I think mm-hmm. the amount of impact we have on the world is enormous. Like it's yeah, hard to actually true. overstate that. If we can help engineers by 10%, 20%, make them more impactful, more productive, more confident in their job. Mm. I think we have a huge impact on the world in, in a good mm. way. And so yeah. to your question, like what do we, I want in the next year? I think there's a couple things. One is that I want the number of engineers on Taro to grow 10x, mm. right? And yeah. so I think that um, we have we have a free version of Taro and we, want, we have a paid mm. version of Taro. I want both to grow dramatically, right? Um, mm. and, and the idea is that I want it to be such that the value of Taro is so obvious because just one good question, one good insight can dramatically change your perspective on the job. And software yeah. engineers mm. are paid so much that just, you know, half a percent or like 0.1% of their salary mm. is enough. That if we can have enough people do that, you can, b- yeah. can build a big enough business based off 0.1% of a salary of an engineer. And I think we can provide mm-hmm. way more value, right? Like I want to, I don't want to just yeah. take people's money and, and not provide value. I want it to be obvious, the value that Taro is providing, um, mm-hmm. through the, we have, we have these things called case studies, right? Where people come in and talk yeah. about their journey. We have this Q and a mm-hmm. platform and we also have partnerships with different companies. So if you come into Taro, mm-hmm. you get a discount mm-hmm. or you get a free access to these other products and services. And so mm-hmm. over time, we're going to become more and more valuable to an engineer. And as a mm-hmm. result, I want us to grow by 10x or more in the next one year yeah uh, that seems a pretty fair estimate and yeah i think that taro is really great uh so i've used blind also and i've used taro also so on a on blind it's kind of a lot of negativity is yeah. <laughs> around a lot of things so a lot of people can go that route but on taro i see a lot of meaningful discussions being happening so it's really great yeah exactly that's, that's the goal so i'm glad i'm glad to hear that you, that's the experience you've had <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh considering like recent layoffs a lot of people are saying that the tech industry is going diff- uh, going down and all those things so what are your views like what's going to happen on the coming weeks or months yeah i think that it is unfortunate i mean for the vast majority of people i think that this is the first time that we have experienced 
any kind of downturn in the market. You know, literally since yeah. 2009, right? Mm, the market right. has always been up and to the right. Like it's always been good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so it is a bit scary. And I think that if you're graduating now, then this is probably the worst job market that is because interest rates are way higher. Right. And that means mm. that people don't want the speculative project that's going to happen mm. three or four years from now. They want to focus on things that make money right now. I just want money yeah, in right. the bank now rather than some speculation yeah. three or four years from now. And mm. so all of the people who are working on like actually the project I worked on at Meta at Facebook mm. was called portal. That was a bet. That was a long-term bet that, Hey, five years from now or 10 years from now, this, this is going to be how people communicate. It was mm. like a video calling okay. device. But now mm. what you're finding is that meta doesn't have the patience for that anymore. And so mm, many right. of the people who worked on that team got laid off. In fact, if I had stayed at Facebook, there was a good chance I would have been laid off. Right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> okay. um, I think that, yeah, because of that, there's not as much hiring going on. Mm. Um, people want to save money and, and get to profitability. And that means that um, this kind of downward trend will continue for at least a few months, probably for mm -hmm. most of 2023. Yeah. So uh, in these times, what should like any engineer who is graduating or even a senior engineer who is working at a company should you think should focus on? I think a couple of things. One is that, yeah, if you're in your engineer, then you should make the decision on how, like in general, I think the best time to, look for a job is when you don't need a job and so <laughs> you should evaluate your company and see how secure mm. do you feel if mm. there's a pretty good chance that you might get laid off then i think maybe test the waters right don't quit but like maybe spend five or ten hours a week networking and trying to figure out other opportunities um mm. if you're starting out in the job market i think it becomes mm. a little bit harder but i would, what i what i tell people all the time is similar to me building a startup what are mm. your unfair advantages right like what can you do or what are your mm. unique insights that other people can't don't have because that is where you're mm. going to find results that's where you're going to be able to find a job so for example mm. if you have a network uh, if you have a referral like you have someone who really can advocate for you mm. talk to them and say hey can you get me a referral at your company right or mm. if you have a deep passion for a particular domain like cybersecurity mm. or AI or mobile development. like, And you can show people that, hey, I have done a lot more work than most people when it comes to mm. building Android apps. I have 10 apps published or like something really crazy like that. Then mm. that's an unfair advantage. You have that and other people don't. So then leverage that mm -hmm. and you'll be able to much more likely find a job. So that would be kind of my yeah. advice if you're either starting out or you know, you're more tenured. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people uh, should, I think, explore different kind of things which they can do. So sometimes people actually don't like software engineering but they're still a software engineer yeah so like uh stanford would have given you a lot of exposure to be even into different domains so did you try any different things apart from uh, software engineering i did i mean i think that one of the benefits of stanford is that it, they do force you to take a lot of different classes even if you like there are a lot of people who come in like oh, i know exactly what i want to do but then mm. you know stanford they call it a liberal arts school right and what that means is yeah. that they force you to take classes in language, in, um, you know, uh, history, in some general education requirements that are beyond just the thing you focused on. And so for me, I think that I definitely got a lot of exposure. Um, mm. And I, I value the, you know, I did a lot of courses in, um, for example, like the history of the Incan Empire in South America, like things that, you know, it's oh, yeah. like very, very different. I would never have taken those unless I was required to. Um, mm -hmm. which is valuable. But I think for me, did I consider anything else? Mm. Not not really. I feel like by the time I hit my second or third year in college, mm. I was pretty sure that all the smart people, not all the smart people, but many of the smart people I knew were focused mm. on computer science. And I felt like okay. there was so much opportunity. Like mm. in Silicon Valley, there's so much uh, excitement. And you could create mm. something which helps millions of people just by writing code. And it, it just felt like yeah. the other fields I was studying didn't have that same excitement level. And so mm. I think I was pretty sure I wanted to do computer science by the time I had my second or third year. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that seems great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like it has been like an amazing journey. And that in that you did YouTube also. So like what did you do? Like how did you actually grow your channel? Uh what things are you thinking apart from distribution for your startup like what is the major goal of the channel that you actually started with 
because you started the channel without thinking of the app right yeah that's right that's right yeah. yeah and i think that's actually another thing like going back to what we talked about earlier um hmm. if you didn't go to stanford you didn't go to iit right then i feel like it's important that you manufacture luck right you create luck and i feel like one really easy way to do that in today's day and age is just create content and i think that was kind of the idea mm. with youtube is that mm. i don't know where this is going i have no idea what will happen with youtube but i want to yeah. put myself <laughs> out there i want to create content and then somehow somewhere one year from now five years from now if i continue being persistent with youtube something good will happen mm. that was my thought that was that was that was as far as i thought and i think it kind of worked out um yeah. so yeah when i started out i feel like uh it was android i I basically taught, what do I know? What do I know that could add value to people? And I thought, okay, Android mm -hmm. development. I, I'm a pretty good Android developer. I've been making Android apps. I can teach people how to do Android. And mm. so I did that for about a year. Um, mm. And I would say like there are a couple key inflection points. One is that, have you heard of this channel called Free Code Camp? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. what I found is that Free Code Camp, they actually don't have full-time instructors. So typically what mm. they do is that they will take content from other creators like me or other people if they mm -hmm. think that you're good enough they'll publish it on their channel yeah mm -hmm. and so um when i found that out i discovered that i emailed them and said hey i've been doing android tutorials i've been an android developer for about five or six years now and here's a sample of my content do you think it's good enough that you could publish it and they said, yeah sure um and so i actually made a separate <laughs> course for them and so if i okay. think about like the key inflection point i think there were two one is I was just, mm. I started publishing content. I was growing not that fast. But I was like kind of growing okay. Mm -hmm. When I published a free code camp video on their channel, mm. immediately I like doubled my <laughs> subscriber count. <laughs> um, because, okay. you know, the free code camp channel has six million subscribers. Yeah, six million. I think at that point I had like two or three million, but it was okay. huge. I mean, compared to me, I had like three or 4,000 subscribers at that point. Right? So I was like, wow, this is like literally a thousand times <laughs> bigger. Um, and so I think that was like one big inflection point. It's okay. Now I'm on the map. People know mm. kind of my channel exists and they can subscribe and follow it. Um, mm. And the other big inflection point was I did a collaboration with a pretty big YouTuber, Clement. Mm. Um, yeah, and that video okay. did quite well. Um, mm -hmm. And so okay. I think like my advice would basically be like, if you can, if you can leverage the distribution networks of other people, mm then mm -hmm. that's actually really powerful. So Free Code Camp was really game changing for me. And then the collaboration with Clement was also really helpful. And then from there, I, I, mm. I kept making more and more videos. I kind of pivoted my channel to be more focused mm. on career growth rather than Android. And that also helped. And that's kind of yeah. how I got to where I am now. Okay. Yeah. Great. So you have kind of all the experiences that uh, a person can possibly think of, like going to Stanford, going to Y Combinator, being a YouTuber, and yeah. being a startup founder. <laughs> so <laughs> that's quite diverse. Yeah, that's true. No, I, I mean, that's, it, it's been a lot of ups and downs. Like some days I'm just so burned out. But I feel like, yeah, I, I, yeah. Think that I like how you said it. I, I've had a full life. Like I'm grateful. I mean, I'm very grateful yeah. that I've been able to do all of these things. And I think that that's kind of the joy of, the joy of experimenting, the joy of life is that you try out everything, yeah. you see what works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty great. So it was quite insightful to you about different things. And this was a really great talk. And uh, thank you so much again for taking your time to do this. Yeah, it's super fun. I am excited to see us go live. And yeah, it was really nice chatting with you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah.